What's up, guys? Welcome back to the fourth side. We're talking some Marvel news, specifically Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania's box office performance. So, careful for spoilers. If you haven't watched the movie, and based on these numbers, you probably haven't. Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, nosedived into the quantum realm for its second weekend drop off, posting at a whopping 70%, making it the biggest second week drop in MCU history. And if that isn't indicative enough of the current state of the MCU, it's behind Thor Love and Thunder, the movie that made Chris Hemsworth rage quit his high paying gig and crazy directors in Taika Waititi, high as a kite is more like it. <laughs> it <did. laughs> The big drop is in part due to the negative reviews of the film. As it stands, this third MM film has the second worst rating of 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, sitting behind Eternals 47% or the entire MCU. And then in the Wasp Quantumania, screw it, I'm calling it Quantumania from now on, made its debut in half empty theaters. Some completely empty, save for two or three seats, last week as the next installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This movie marks the start of Phase 5 after an abysmal Phase 4, and quite frankly, we expected more. You'd think Ant-Man choosing his daughter over the entire multiverse is the entire movie. Well, it isn't. It would have made much more sense and it would have made much more money, but they had to do something else. The studio also marketed Quantumania as an Avengers level event, but it wasn't. It wasn't even comparable to Captain America Civil War. They also teased the introduction of MCU's latest overarching villain, Kang the Conqueror, played by Jonathan Majors, which it was, but not the way they would have liked. Kang is a C-list Avengers villain and quite frankly, Ultron is better. Doc Dr. Doom is better. But where are they? Probably benched until the current saga wraps out. Nathaniel Richards aka Kang is a human time traveler from the 30th century. He's a descendant of Fantastic Force Reed Richards and possibly Victor Von Doom. The problem? People don't know who the hell he is. And as if to confuse people even more, he was already introduced in the finale of Loki Season 1, a TV show that nobody watched but had to to make sense the multiverse saga. To be honest, it's just some device so they can pull IPs mostly those they don't have rights to like Spider-Man and Venom, or IPs they just bought, like Deadpool and the Mutants, in and out of their continuity. A device they can use to retread the last battle in Avengers Endgame, and it's the lazy way of doing things without having to do the actual work of writing them in, work that will go to the VFX department instead of the writer's room. If it feels like you're getting deliberately confused, and you, the paying customer, have to do the work to catch up on what's happening on screen, well that's because you are, and you do. And surprise surprise, the plan backfires, and it didn't resonate as much much to audiences despite Jonathan Major's competent performance. This is what it takes to be a Marvel fan these days. Do your homework by consuming content you don't want, and with the amount of content dropping, it's no wonder the audiences are dropping in droves. Interconnection doesn't mean it has to be complex. Keep it simple. Keep it simple and people will come and see it. Coming into the movie, they assume you know Kang, he's terrible, he's a conqueror, but we don't see any of that. He doesn't do any conquering. It's not even terrible, not really. He doesn't oppress the quantum people, his robots shout at some people, I think, on the street, and he isn't even that powerful. Yeah, he explodes that laser face guy, but he gets eaten by ants by the end and hope kind of shoots him down. At the end of the day, you must write him in such a way that the average moviegoer gets that he's a threat from what they're watching. Might say, hold on, there's countless versions of him, that's why he's so scary. But the thing is, that's the problem, letting him face Ant-Man in his first outing and losing completely de-escalates his threat potential. Kang is an infinite number of different personas. The character loses value. That's why we're getting a lot of character development post-mortem from the Axis media. Ant-Man 3 writer teases plans for variants that will top Jonathan Majors' Kang. The direct Avengers 5's big death toll teased by MCU writer. All of this to make people think what they failed to show in the movie. Looking at Thanos, the very first scene, he easily defeats the Asgardians, even makes Thor watch as he took care of Loki and Heimdall. Lays out Hulk, supposedly the strongest Avenger, the heavy hitter's gone in the opening sequence here. Kang to some extent is portrayed less than expected. He's disposable. Showing him this early was a mistake. Killing him off was a mistake. Seeing him in an Ant-Man movie was a mistake. The Ant-Man movies are different from the big epic sci-fi action movies. It's the movie you get to to kick back and the laugh stakes are really low and the characters can goof around. That's the reason I think the first Ant-Man movie really worked is that it knows what it is. I like that first Ant-Man movie a lot in part because it had a little bit of Edgar 
Wright, one of my favorite directors in there. For the most part, it was small, self-contained. It had residual influences from the other MCU events for sure, but for the most part, it was a good movie. MN2 is kind of the same, smaller stakes, added a couple of characters. Bill Foster, formerly Goliath, was supposed to introduce. Some of it was not that great. Overall, not a bad movie. These two movies work because it had a lot of the same beats. What made Ant-Man stand out? Small things become really big, big things become really small. It can't be any simpler than that. Can't really do that in the quantum realm though because everything's already small. So you got Kang and all the Star Wars, the action sci-fi adventure thing in there too and largely it's underwhelming because the necessary world building for something like that was lacking in the movie. The little we got felt rushed. Screen time that was supposed to go to character development of the main cast was sidelined by weird whole obsessed aliens and rebel leaders. People didn't get the usual Ant-Man fun of the first two. It didn't really deliver as a sci-fi movie epic as well. This movie fails to deliver on either one of those types of movies and it's now hit the box office. It opened at $105 million, which is to be fair higher than the first two Ant-Man movies that were released what years back. But the Hollywood trades will also always tend to say that about this movie. In comparison to older movies, it did pretty well. But what they neglect to tell you is that when compared to other superhero movies that came out this year or so, is that it's way off. Thor 4 opened at $144 million, and that's almost $40 million disparity. What I'm most telling, and just to hammer the point here, in the second weekend performance, it fell behind Behind every other movie, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness dropped 67%, Black Panther and Wakanda Forever dropped 63%, Thor Love and Thunder 68% which is the most near. Now you'll hear Disney is not worried. The Ant-Man sequel has now grossed a total of 167 million domestically and 363 million worldwide. Industry experts will say most Marvel movies are front loaded meaning it will offset the drop depending on the amount of money it makes when it comes out. Well that remains to be true for monstrously front loaded ones like Spider-Man No Way Home, the relatively weak opening for Ant-Man 3, shown in this graph tapering off right here, will ultimately land it below recent Phase 4 movies. Great start for Phase 5. Speaking of Phase 4, it is the lowest point so far designed to expand the MCU roster with C-list characters and at the same time replace A-list characters, even B-list ones that they made that people actually love. The heroes that build the MCU brand like Captain America, Steve Rogers, Iron Man, Tony Stark, Thor, Hulk, everyone's getting demoted or even killed off. People were just not interested in the movie and the word of mouth is really weak. Not a lot of people are telling their friends to go see this movie and that tends to hurt your movie's performance. And regardless how they paint the movie's overall box office numbers, the numbers just don't lie. It's not at par with what's supposed to be the change in direction, the promise of a more serious tone, the consequence driven story. It turns out they lied again because not a thing in this movie mattered. In the end, everything's back to status quo. Bad guys taking care of one big family again. And yeah, they might turn that around by 2025 when Prime Kang comes back and they say that Ant-Man is trapped in a quantum rail or some time loop and they retread the Avengers movies. But until it is, it isn't. That's your short nearest cat paradox. Well, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe to get more nerdy stuff. See you on the next one.